I don't have any seats left anyway, so I'm not good time to start as any. Did you want to? Well, we just want to welcome everybody here. Thank you so much for coming to on this uh, winter day in yeah. April. <laughs> it's a perfect thing to do on a day like this. Um, we're so thankful for Steve for coming out here and presenting this uh, program uh, to you. Um, all of you, um, be sure that you get our yellow calendar before you leave. There's some downstairs and there's some up here. That will give you information about our other events that are coming up. Uh, we do have the Yarn Bomb this year, and we'll be uh, putting that up in May. There's still some spaces available, so if you're a knitter and you want to participate or you've got some projects at home that never quite uh, really materialized into what you thought it would materialize, it would be perfect for wrapping around a tree branch. Uh, you can certainly participate in it. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have our Blast of the Past. That's going to be on Saturday, May 7th. We're hoping it'll be spring by then, and that's a free family event, so bring your kids, bring your grandkids, your nieces and nephews, and they'll get a chance to participate in a lot of different things, like uh, we're going to still keep with the yarn bomb team, so they're going to be able to make a little yarn bomb project, and they'll also be able to learn to weave and carding and all sorts of other textile uh, arts that were done um, throughout the past and still even now today, so it's great that this type of art is still very popular with uh, young people, too. And anything else, please look at, like I say, look at our event calendar. Uh, uh, we do have one really uh, fun event, too, that's coming up for those of you. It was a very good program last year about uh, Cedar Lake. Lee Krieger presented that. Well, he's going to do it again. It's going to be about the resorts and businesses around Cedar Lake, and that's going to be on May 17th, and we're doing it at Padway, so it'll be right out there by the lake, so you you can kind of learn and then go out and look at the lake and reimagine what it would have looked like in the past. So, I'm going to, I just heard the bell ringing, so I got a feeling there's more people coming up. <laughs> so, we'll get them in here. Hi, how are you? <laughs> There are a few seats. If you have a seat near you, raise your hand so they'll so they know where they can go. And, um, <laughs> just find, grab a seat. People are raising their hands. Where there's a seat near them, there's one over there. There's one right next to Mike. You can are you going to sit down? by him. There's one back here by the fireplace. There's one up there. So um, there's one by Anne. Is that free by you too? And that seat next to you. Okay, good. And if you need to, you know, move over, squish over a little bit, or, you know, once we're settled in to, so you can, you can see, go right ahead. And um, I think we'll get started then. Yeah, thanks, thank Steve. You. <clears throat> well, thanks, everybody, for coming today. It's, uh, I'm excited to present this. I did it once before in Kewaskum, and um, I'm actually going to be presenting again at the Wisconsin Library Association Conference in May. Um, and that's going to be more about the research part of this, although the research is part of the whole story that I'm telling today. Um, so I was the director of the Kewaskum Library for 15 years, and I have since moved on. I'm in Sun Prairie now, um, but I'm still kind of carrying my interest with me, so I'm kind of ongoing. There's more research that I would like to do about Chief Kewaskum. Um, but for now, uh, this is a presentation that kind of talks about um, kind of gathers all the information that we have about Chief Kewaskum, puts it in one place, kind of tries to make sense of everything. Um, there's not a lot of information out there, but hopefully um, I think I've kind of caught all of it, so we'll be able to talk about that a little bit. And um, hopefully we'll have time at the end if anyone has questions. I will answer as many questions as I either know how to answer or can make up really quickly. <laughs> so... Uh, like I said, I was the director of the Kewaskum Library, and uh, one of the things that I would do there is um, reference work. So whenever somebody had a question, they, I would get lots of emails, lots of genealogy, local history, um, emails from people, lots of phone calls. Uh, a couple of summers ago, I was, I was at the front desk and the phone rang, and it was this gentleman here, um, Sean Tashner from Seattle. And, you know, I, like I said, I get a lot of phone calls from all over the place. I wasn't, you know, thinking much of it until he said, um, he says, 
I, I live in Seattle, Washington, and I'm the seventh great grandson of Chief Kiwasco. And right, I had the same, I had the same, uh, the same feeling. I thought, well, this, this is incredible, um, because everything that I had read, um, all the research that I had done up until that point, there's not really any way of knowing whether Chief Kiwaskum had any remaining relatives. Uh, so I thought, well, this is great. I mean, this guy's got to have some information that I don't have. So he says, um, so he asked me, you know, do I have any information, any stories that I could share with him about Chief Kiwaskum? Um, uh, so I, I did. Um, but so this is a picture of Sean with his, his daughter. Um, the reason that he had gotten into the research in the first place is because um, he and his daughter were trying to enroll into the Menominee tribe here, here in Wisconsin. And they kept running up against kind of different historical road, roadblocks. They were trying to give proof that they were whatever percentage uh, they had to be in order to be enrolled in the, in the tribe. Um, and they were not coming up with, with that. Um, and it was really important to him too because he had grown up hearing stories about um, his, his grandmother and great-grandmother and his great-great-grandmother and, and the different things that they had done in the Menominee Reservation and in Door County. Um, so as he's telling me these things, I thought, well, uh, that, that doesn't sound exactly like what I know about Chief Kiwaskum. So I said, why don't you send me your email address, um, send me some information, and we can, we can have this conversation. Um, so... Sean traveled to the Menominee Reservation, and he talked to some of the elders there, and they said, well, there's this village down in Washington County named after Kewaskum. Uh, go, you know, you should talk to them. Uh, so this is what Sean sent me, and this is his, uh, the paternal lineage of, of his family. And you can see up here at the top uh, is Peter Kewaskum, uh, who is four-fourth Menominee. Uh, so right away, this kind of started out weird to me because everything I know of Chief Kiwaskum is that he was Potawatomi. So uh, once I got this, this kind of really got me um, interested in in uh, helping Sean figure out how his family fits in with the village. Um, some of you might recognize this. Um, Kiwaskum class of 1975 created this mural uh, in the... Um, uh, basketball court of Kiwaskum High School, and about around the same time as Sean had contacted me, maybe a year before, um, this mural had been painted over, and it was a big deal in town because you know this was it was you know it's an important um, uh, present from from the class of '75, and and it also kind of reflects the the history of the village itself. Um, so people were concerned about it, and and. People kept coming into the library and saying, Where, where's your books about Chief Kiwaskum? I want to know about Chief Kiwaskum. And, and there aren't any books about Chief Kiwaskum. <laughs> um, there's, there's one book that was published in 1976, that so we'll talk about that, um, written by a high school student. And he, did, he had done some research about Chief Kiwaskum, and there's a page or two of information in that. Um, but that's about it. Um, so... Um, so because of that, you know, people asking me about it, I started to, to dig into the research a little bit. Um, and then I got a call from the fourth grader, the, the fourth grade teachers at Kiwaskum Elementary School. And so in, in fourth grade, they do Wisconsin history. And they had a sheet of paper with a story about Chief Kiwaskum on it that they said, we don't know where this came from. We've been teaching it, but we don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> you know, can, you, can you help us figure that out? So, you know, all three of these things kind of happened at the same time. And so I, I really started thought well, this is a great chance for me to really dig into the research of, of the community and to, you know, try to figure out as much as I can about Chief Kiwaskum. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this is, uh, these are the, the two primary resources that we have with information, at least as far as the, the village of Kiwaskum is concerned. Um, so the first, Kiwaskum Then and Now, was written by Mark Smucker. He was a high school student in Kiwaskum in the, the mid to late 70s. Um, you know, 1976 was the bicentennial of the United States, so there was uh, all these communities all across the country were, you know, doing pageants and parades and erecting statues and, and doing all these things to celebrate the bicentennial. Uh, the bicentennial committee uh, had Mark do a history of the village, and it was the first one that was ever written. And, and like I said, it was it's a great uh, it's a great book. It's it's completely out of print now and very hard to find. 
I'm sure that probably everyone in Kewaskum who's been there for, for 30 years or so has got a pile of them in their, in their basement somewhere, but, um, but they're, they're, they can't get them anymore. Um, you know, I've seen them show up on eBay you know, for, for, for hundreds of dollars. Um, don't sell yours there, though. Just donate them to the Kewaskum Library if you want. <laughs> um, so it would be really great. Actually, that would be a great project for somebody to, be, to update that, get it reprinted, um, because, like I said, it, it's, it's, you can't find it. It's not available online. It's information that you can't get anywhere else. Um, so there's that. And then there's this, uh, which you find this photo. They have a copy of it downstairs here at the, in the Historical Society, um, which is supposedly the only known photo of Chief Kiwasco. Now, uh, you know, the, nobody knows where this photo actually came from, so that's, that's kind of a one weird thing about it. Um, another weird thing about it is all the stories that we have of Chief Kiwasco would place him at an impossibly old age at the time that this photo would have been taken. Um, and, I mean, this gentleman is very old, but, I mean, he would have had to have been, you know, approaching 100 or even older at the time this photo was taken. So, you know, no, nobody knows for sure, but, but um, so where this photo comes from is um, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a priest in Kewaskum, um, the Father Mayor, and he um, had done a thesis paper about the history of the village of Kewaskum. And he, this is a photo that he came up with. Again, nobody knows, nobody knows where he got it. Um, but that's kind of been, and ever, ever since, that was in, in 1940, he, he came out with his paper. And, and again, that, that's never been published, uh, except in 1995, the Kewaskum Statesman actually reprinted the entire um, uh, paper in, in their newspaper for um, the anniversary of the village. Um, so it is available in the back issues of the Statesman. I think they have those here on microfilm if you're interested. But again, that's not available online or anywhere else. Um, so we have these two things, and um, that was kind of my starting place. So where, you know, where did where did Mark get his information from? Where did Father Mary get his information from? How can we get these things together? And how can we make a connection with this phone call that I got with this this guy wanting to know? more about his seventh great grandfather and is that even possible um there's a blank page so there was uh there was sean there's our there's our mural and then of course there's our photo of chief kiwaskum um so almost everything that we know about chief kiwaskum comes from either second or third hand there's one first hand account in existence uh, and it's actually pretty cool. We'll talk about that later. Um, so what do we know about Chief Kiwaskum? We don't know a whole lot. These are the, the ab absolute uh, concrete historical facts. Uh, chief Kiwaskum was a Potawatomi. He was the chief of his band. And he lived in southeastern Wisconsin in the 1850s. Um, I'm sure, obviously, he lived before that as well. But all the stories that we have come from the 1850s. Uh, so... I did some uh, looking. Um, the the word Kiwaskum comes from the Algonquin word uh, Washkamo, which means the road is is crooked. Um, spoken out loud, it probably sound more like Kiwaskum, and it means uh, he turns on his tracks. Um, so as I started doing um, searches, and, and I was doing almost all of my research online, um, you know, by going to various historical websites and newspaper archives and, um, and just typing in the word first Kiwaskum and then I would try, well, what about Washkamo? And, and pretty soon I came up with all these variations wow, wow. of the spelling of, of <coughs> what this word Washkamo would come to be known as uh, as a proper name. So you can see up, up at the top, the, the top two were the ones that I thought were probably closest to how it would have sounded pronounced by the Potawatomi. Yes, sir. Could I interject something? Sure. Actually, the word Kiwaskum, the way I understand, was the fork in the two rivers. Okay, well, we will definitely talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so these are all the different variations of, of the name that I saw spelled out, including this one, which is really, uh, <laughs> really something. But um, So um, the, the, the name Kiwaskum seems to be common in um, all three of uh, the... the um, 
all three of the, the tribes that come that speak the Algonquin language. So the Potawatomi, uh, the Ottawa, and the Chippewa or Ojibwe. And so most of these names come from uh, discussions of the Ottawa chief, whose name was Kewaskum. Um, he was at the um, signing of the, the, the Treaty of Chicago in 1821, and we were, that's where they, they, the treaty that they made with the United States, which essentially gave all their land to the United States. Um, so there, there was a chief Kewaskum there who talked about the history of his tribe and of the, the three tribes um, that were related to each other. Um, so here is a here's a, draw, a drawing of a Potawatomi chief from 1827. You notice he's got uh, a beaver skin cap uh, with a porcupine roach. That's the, the kind of flower shaped thing in the front there. Um, the facial tattoos. He's actually wearing a, a dress because <laughs> he thought it looked cool. I mean, I mean, um, you know, I mean, they, they didn't wear European clothes, so when they saw European clothes that they liked, they just wore them. Um, and then another. Uh, Potawatomi chief, again, from 1827. Um, you can see the, the variations. I mean, they look very different from each other, very different types of, of, of you know, ways of, of wearing hats and things. Um, these, were, these were drawn by uh, uh, James Otto Lewis, who was an artist who traveled with the United States Army and drew pictures of the different Potawatomi chiefs, the Ottawa chiefs, during, during these treaty signings. Um, so, because there, there was no photography then, and you know, we would have no way of knowing who any of these people were, what they looked like, except for James Otto Lewis. He published uh, an entire book that um, is out of print. All the originals have been destroyed. It's at the Smithsonian Institute. I think they have a, a few of his drawings at the uh, at MOA here, the Museum of Wisconsin Art. Um, so, that was uh, those are some examples of some Potawatomi chiefs from the same era as Chief Kewaskin would have been in Wisconsin. Um, and again, just a little bit of background about the Potawatomi themselves. Uh, they had been in the uh, in Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan for for a couple hundred years at this point. Um, the Potawatomi chief, the, the Potawatomi would have would have lived like a lot of other of the woodland Indian groups. They would um, hunted deer, muskrat, elk, and bear. They fished, gathered berries and herbs. Uh, and roots for food. They also had farms, so they would they would farm crops like tobacco, corn, beans, pumpkin, and squash. And and we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the areas that that some of the historical areas where Chief Kewaskum was, where they they had farms. Um, so here's a just a drawing, of course, of a of a Potawatomi in, in winter garb with a, a stone tipped bow and arrow. Um, Here's a, a diorama of what would have been um, muskrat and wild rice um, harvesting community. And um, Chief Kewaskum, in, in his dealings with settlers that were in Wisconsin at the time, they were all in, in places like this, because that's where the European settlers you know, would, would come as well, because there was good water here. And he, they had their villages or their hunting camps in those places, too. Um, as far as being a chief goes, uh, the Potawatomi divided themselves into clans, and so they had lots of different clans based on animals and spirits. Um, we don't know a lot about the Potawatomi clan system because by the time uh, people came, uh, Wisconsin archaeologists came to to learn about it, there were not many traditional Potawatomi left to talk to talk to them about them. Um, so a lot of the clans, their, their names are based on animals. Uh, to be a chief of a clan, it wasn't really, it wasn't like a president or a king. It was, it was just a, a kind of a, a leadership position within the clan. A lot of clans had two chiefs. They would have a peacetime chief who would do all the kind of negotiating and, and trade. And they would have a wartime chief, which would be more, you know, like a general or, you know, lead, leading the, the, the um, people into battle. Um, Kewaskum, from, from the, there's only one place, uh, one, one uh, document that talks about his, um, his clan, and it, it looks like he was a member of, the, of the, the Bear Clan. Now, in the Potawatomi clan system, the members of the Bear Clan were often uh, warriors and poli police officer type, type people. 
Um, so that'll make sense when we see later the, the one um, contemporary account of Chief Kiwanskum that we have. All right, so 1833 is an important time uh, for the Potawatomis. Um, in the 1830s, the United States government had signed all the treaties they were going to sign, and they were moving all of the, the tribes from Wisconsin off their native lands west to the Indian territories. 1833 is one that kind of was the end of that as far as the Potawatomi were concerned. Um, so this is the 1700s, and you know Wisconsin was was a kind of a center of the, the fur trade in the 1700s. Um, all the, the French fur traders were like up in this area, Green Bay area, um, down into Fond du Lac. Um, and you can see in the green here, this is all Potawatomi land. So, you know, Chicago, Milwaukee, all the way up into Door County, um, and then, you know, from Detroit all the way over. So they had quite a, quite a lot of land that they ceded to the U.S. government. Um, after 1833, we have the land. <laughs> this is a very confusing chart of all the different travels that the Potawatomi went through after that. Um, they left their land. Most of them were sent to um, this, what they would call, they would call the Indian Territory, you know, the state of Oklahoma, which, which was supposed to be just, just Indian Territory, which eventually became a state. Um, so the bands, you know, they were here in Iowa. They just continued to, be, to move west and south. So the majority of the Potawatomi now from Wisconsin, whose, whose ancestors are from Wisconsin, are in the Prairie Band of Potawatomi here in Kansas, and uh, the citizen band in Oklahoma. That's where the, that's where the majority of them are now. Um, now, Chief Kewaskum, by the, by the time that we start hearing about him in the 1840s and 1850s, technically he's here illegally. So him and his band, um, they don't have any right to the land that they're on anymore. Um, technically they could be forced west, just like everyone else. Um, they either came back or they just didn't leave at all. We don't know for sure. Um, but the, the Potawatomi that remained in Wisconsin, like Chief Kewaskum and his, his tribe, um, the ones who weren't rounded up eventually went north. So you can see, uh, let's see, the Forest County Band up here in red um, is, is the last of the Wisconsin-based Potawatomi. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards, towards the end of the presentation. So just to give you um, kind of a visual sense of the time that we're talking about, this is 1840, uh, and anyone recognize this this map? This, yeah. So, right. So here's the Milwaukee River. There's this. There's the Kewaskum, the bend in the river right here. That is Kewaskum. So this is 1840, and again, this is the time when we start hearing about Chief Kewaskum um, being met by the settlers who were in Washington County. Um, there's nothing there. The village isn't there. Um, it's not even. Kewaskum Township at this point. Um, at this point, this is uh, Township 12, Township 12, Range 19. And then there's some rivers. Um, so there weren't many people here, if, if any at all, yet at this point, uh, at least in, in the Kewaskum area. Uh, the first mention that we have historically of Chief Kewaskum is in 1842. And here we, we hear that he's living... Um, near someone named Dow, uh, at it, near near their farm um, on Lake Ripley, which is in Dodge County. Um, it's a small lake, but you know there, like I said, there were lots of different places that the that the Potawatomi would go to. They they didn't just have one village that they lived at, although the village on Pike Lake seemed to be the the main village for Kewaskum's band. Um, so, but so you're going to see them moving around a lot at this time. Um, so Chief Kewaskum's first mention, 1842. There's one sentence that says that um, this this Roe Dow, who has a farm on Lake Ripley, one of his neighbors is Chief Kewaskum. That's all we have. Uh, also in 1842, we hear that um, there is a sizable village on Pike Lake that is where Chief Kewaskum and his band lives. Um, now, this village would be where they would have had um, the most permanent of their structures. 
So, I mean, if you go downstairs into the museum area, um, you can see one of the one of the structures that the Potawatomi would have had. You know, everything is still just made of, of you know very temporary things. You know, skins and 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 small trees and things like that. Um, but they also had um, farm. They also had a, a, a farm here, and the the later settlers would see you know these these kinds of like small mounded places where they would have planted their beans and their corn and things like that. Um, and there was definitely one of those here in Pike Lake. Um, so this map comes from a woman that, after I gave this talk in Kewaskum last year, she contacted me uh, and said, well, my family lived, has lived on Pike Lake for several generations, and she had some family stories about Chief Kewaskum's tribe that she wanted to share with me. So she, this is a, a drawing that she made of where their farm was uh, in, the, in the red here. And so this whole area right here would have been where Chief Kewaskum's um, tribe was. So they lived at the same time with this family of, of settlers in the 1840s that was, you know, planting a, a farm there at the same time. Um, one of the things that she sent me, and this is really cool, um, this is a picture of an artifact that she still has. And this was actually, uh, this was actually made by uh, someone in Chief Kewaskum's tribe and given to the farmer, John Frank, who lived there in the 1850s. So, I mean, this, this could possibly be like the last remaining thing that was touched by Chief Kewaskum's people. Um, and this woman has it, and, you know, she didn't want me to say too much about where she was because, <laughs> she, and she, she also has, um, she mentioned some, some uh, chicken feather flowers that some of, the, some of the tribal women had made for her great, great, Great grandmother um, that they still have in the family as well. Um, so you know, there's these artifacts around. It was really, it was really interesting <coughs> to talk to her through through mail um, and, and learn a little bit about that. So another story from 1842-1843 is um, takes place on Pine Lake. Um, so Pine Lake is uh, south of. It's pretty far south compared to the rest of the places where Chief Kewaskum was at the time. But, but it sounds like there, there were a lot of, um, a lot of different tribes that, that were in this, this area. Um, so there was a Swedish um, settler, uh, Gustav Unionius, who wrote this, he has these, this two volume book about the time that he, he and his family went from Sweden and planted essentially kind of a utopian community around their church. Um, we were the first Swedish settlers in Wisconsin, and uh, he, was a, he was a pastor. They built, they went out there, built some log cabins, and just uh, decided they were going to be there and, and preach. And um, so he wrote these memoirs, a picture of him, uh, and this is, this is the only place where we actually have someone talking about Chief Kiwaskum. He doesn't call him Chief Kiwaskum. Um, he calls him Kiwagushkum. But it's undoubtedly the same person. Um, he's a Potawatomi chief. Um, according to Gustav Eunonius, uh, Chief Kiwaskum seemed to have been, he was a really good hunter, uh, for, for all that we know. Um, every, the, the, the two stories that he tells in, the, in these books um, are all about hunting. And the, the first one is the way that he met the chief, which is, which is that uh, he, was, he was out in the woods in the winter, some deer ran past him, and then running very quickly after the deer was Chief Kiwaskum, who then waited until the deer um, he, uh, chased the deer into the lake, which was frozen at the time. When the deer broke through the ice, then he just went up because they, they couldn't move, and he, he cut their legs with, with, a, with an axe, and then I guess waited for him to bleed out or something. I'm not sure exactly what, but that was how he killed the deer. And so that was the first kind of time that he met Chief Kiwaskum and his, his tribe. Um, and then the second story, which is kind of funny, is about Chief Kiwaskum borrowing um, a, a gun that used to belong to the King of Sweden <laughs> uh, and saying that he would return it in the next day or two. And it was like a year later that he actually brought it back, but it was all polished up and, and ready. And he would, turned out to be a very good shot, even though they, they didn't hunt with guns at, at that time. Um, so those books, if you can find them, Pioneer in Northwest America, uh, they're not available online. 
There's some copies of the Kewaskum Library in the reference section, if you're interested. Um, but those are the only stories they actually have of Chief Kewaskum. It doesn't talk much about um, really anything about him as a historical figure. You know, just that, again, he's a Potawatomi chief. Uh, he is an expert hunter. Uh, and he seems to be a really nice guy. I mean, he really got along well with with uh, Gustav Eunonius and his people. Um, and then we see this in, in every historical account that we have about Chief Kewaskum, that him and his band traded with the, with the settlers wherever they could. Um, they were helpful. They were, they were, you know, they, they were staying on the land that they technically were not supposed to be on, and they knew it, I'm sure. They didn't want to leave, but they, they, weren't, they didn't make trouble for the people who were there now. Um, and I think, part, I, think, I think a lot of that is, is one of the reasons why uh, the, the township and the village then became named after him was because he was this famous figure at the time who was just a really nice guy. I mean, he was kind of opposite all the, the horror stories that were told at the time about Indians. You know, there was a lot of different scares in the, in the mid to late 1800s um, in Fond du Lac and in, in Horicon. You can read uh, stories about some of the things that happened. Um, just, you know, people being really scared of uh, the, the tribes at the time. Um, but, you know, uh, Chief Kiwaskum and his people were, were, never, were never like that. Um, another historical uh, statement we have about Chief Kiwaskum comes from 1845. Um, and this says that he lived on um, Cedar Creek, which is, you know, a small creek that comes from uh, Little Cedar Lake and then kind of moves south. And it says that he was he was the next door neighbor to this uh, Denison Maxim, who was a surveyor, who lived. In, this is uh, let's see. This map is from a little bit later. Um, this is a plat map from 1859. So, and you can see that things have been divided up quite a bit. But Maxim still has his land here, uh, and here's Cedar Creek right here running through it. So, you know, Chief Kewaskum and his band had some sort of place somewhere in this area. That's about all we know. Uh, 1850, uh, this is Lake Hoshkanag, and um, you know it's a it's a kind of a just a really wide spot in the Rock River. Um, the Rock River, which kind of starts north of of Horicon Marsh, um, anywhere seems between Lake Hoshkanag and Horicon Marsh along the Rock River was a were places where the tribes of the time spent a lot of time hunting and, and fishing, gathering wild rice. Um, so there's a lot of stories um, about different tribes, mainly the Potawatomi, but also the, the Sauk and the Fox in, in that area. Um, so Chief Kewaskum's people were said to have had a muskrat hunting camp here. And see all these little um, dots, I've overlaid a map. Um, this, is, um, this is a map of all of the uh, former let's see, places where Indian villages had been and also where there were um, burial mounds. And so that map is overlaid with a, a Google Google map of the present day Lake Hashkinag. Um, so Chief, Chief Kewaskum's village was here. But you can see, I mean, all, all these different places, there were different tribes, and they, they weren't all Potawatomi. There were Menominee tribes there as well and a few other tribes that, that again, were around this lake. Uh, let's see. Let's go back one here. Just mention one thing. Uh, so this bit of land right here um, is called Blackhawk Island. And so 25 years previous to the time that Chief Kewaskum and his band were here, um, where it's the time of the Blackhawk War. Um, so Chief Blackhawk, who was a Sauk <clears throat> warrior, uh, he, he and his band, they were, you know, in, in kind of Northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin. They eventually did make it up to here, and it's called Black Hawk Island because they hid up here um, from the pursuing U.S. Army. Uh, nobody knows, you know, if he ever met Chief Kewaskum. They were definitely contemporaries. Um, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, so the very last mention we have of Chief Kewaskum is of him living on Mud Lake, which is a very... There's a lot of mud lakes in Wisconsin. Um, so th this particular one is in the town of Shields in Dodge County. And uh, I think there's a state natural area where you can get in to, to see the lake, but there's really not much there. Um, evidently, he had a cabin there. That's where he lived. 
And according to most reports, that's where he died. So 1857 is, is that's the last mention that we have. So from 1842 to 1857, um, kind of everything that we know about Chief Kewaskum, uh, at least the Chief Kewaskum that, that the village of Kewaskum is named after, takes place within, within those few years. Um, so yeah, so 1857, Chief Kewaskum lives there. Um, he dies there, uh, as far as we know. And, um, and then he was buried on a place called Barbers Island, which is north of um, Houstonsford, sometime around 1860. Uh, so here is a flat map of the village of Kewaskum around the same time as Chief Kewaskum, uh, the, kind of the end of his, his place in the historical record. Uh, again, 1859. So if you think back to the map I showed you from 18, from 1840, you know this is only this is 20 years later, and everything's platted out. Everyone owns everything now, and we've got the village here, just a you know a few blocks here, right in the middle. Um, Jesse Myers and, and Henry Eames are still here, two of the founders of the village. Um, and and in a few years later, some of those names are gone. You might recognize some of the names on here. There are people that are still here. Um, so this is 1859, this is the village of Kewaskum. So uh, here is again the Google map, and it's places where we have historical eyewitness accounts of Chief Kewaskum uh, or his band having lived. So we've got you know Lake Koshkonog at the very south, and then up the furthest north, um, historical record that we have is on Cedar Creek, but then in between, you know, there's Pike Lake, there's Pine Lake, Lake Ripley, and then Barber's Island up there. Um, so I, when I would give this presentation to the fourth graders at Kewaskum Elementary School, I would always say, well, you know, there's one place on the map where we don't have any historical account of him ever having been, um, and that is the place that is named after him. Um, so why, why, you know, the, 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 there are some stories locally about Chief Kewaskum being in the village or around the village. Um, so after, after I kind of looked at these different historical accounts, I wanted to take a look at those. And in, in particular, where did this photo come from? Um, and who is this guy in the photo? Because when I, when I, when I passed this photo along to Sean Tashner, um, remember he kind of started this whole thing asking me about Chief Kewaskum. Um, when I passed this photo along to him, he said, oh yeah, I recognize this hat right here that's still in my family. So yeah, so so I so then I then made me think. Well, what what what's going on? What's going on here? Um, he said, Yeah, th this hat and this coat are from the Civil War. Chief Kewaskum's grandson uh, was in the Civil War. He gave him this hat, this coat, and there that was something that he, you know, in family stories, he was very proud of those things. And in fact, you know, like I said, the hat is still in his family somewhere. Um, so where did this photo come from? Uh, so here's the village of Kewaskum in 1878. Now, at this point, Chief Kewaskum is gone, uh, and you know the kind of era of, of you know meeting Native Americans in in everyday life is, is kind of gone as, as well. Um, but we do have the, the formation of you know you see all the different streets and things, and then this is starting to look more like the Kewaskum that we know. Um, <clears throat> So around this time, uh, the Wisconsin Archaeological Society started to get really interested in Native American history because they said, well, wait a minute, they're all gone, and we got to make sure that we have some stories so we can, we can you know, hang on to this information. So they went and they started in interviewing people in different communities. Um, so again, the only things that we have written down uh, in the historical record are from, from just really short mentions, little interviews that they did with people in and around the village of Kewaskum. So, first one is Indian Hill, and uh, it was said that there was a place called Indian Hill in the village of Kewaskum, and there was a depression on the top, and supposedly Chief Kewaskum and, had camped there at some point. Um, so, in, in all of the different historical accounts, which is usually just one or two sentences, it says, no one, no one can show us where that is today, and that's kind of the end of it. Um, so then, then, you know, I was interested in that, um, doing my doing my research. Um, so I kind of talked to people around town, the historical society. Yes, sir. That legendary hill. That's what I was going to ask. Well, I don't know what you mean when you say legendary hill. What is that? It's, it's, a, 
on Highway S, right? Going out of town. Huh? Going out of town. Right? Going out of town. Going north out of town. Okay, so, uh, so this is the 1878 map. Um, this is the Google map. And this is the hill here that I was pointed to as, as point, pointed out as, as saying that this is the, is the hill that was called Indian Hill. And I don't know if that's the one that you mean or not. No. But evidently that was, this is where they would, they had a, um, we put up a Christmas tree and a, and a cross on, on Easter time. Right. And I was told that that was. That's not legendary. Yeah. That's not legendary. No. No. That's the next one up. The next hill over. No. It's further north. Further, further north. north. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll have to get the map out and take a look at that. Um, so yeah, so, but there are definitely a few different hills that are that are high enough that are right next to the river, which is where they, they would want to be. Um, so that was the first one. Um, the next one was reports that there that Chief Kiwaskin was buried at North at Northside Park. So Northside Park again, that's not there anymore. Um, but so you can kind of see, you know. The village ended here, so the North, north Side Park was way far north, right over there, which is, um, you know, kind of where Regal Ware is now. Um, this whole area here uh, was where North Side Park was, and there, there were, um, there was one place that I that I read uh, rumors that there were some burial mounds where, kind of where in the area where Regal Ware is now, but there's there was never any other mention about that in the historical record. Um, so again, here's here's a photo of Northside Park. Uh, at the time, the the dam was was a little further north, so there was quite a bit more water there. You know, it's, it's a great <coughs> great place for people to to meet and do stuff. Um, but as far as any other any other information about the the mounds that were there, we don't have any more. Um, Can I just interject? Yeah, I do have information on burial mounds in Kewaskin. Okay, and I'll get that. Yeah, great. That would be really great. Program. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there's the, there's another report that Chief Kiwaskin was buried on in Southside Park. <laughs> um, so Southside Park is, of course, where we um, River Hill Park is now. Um, so as I was doing research about this, I came upon this story from 1968, um, which is I thought was really cool. Um, skeletons. And these, basically, some kids were uh, were swimming there uh, in the river. And they started pulling bones up out of the water, um, which is probably really exciting for them. Uh, so the, the the river they pulled enough bones, evidently an entire an entire skeleton. Um, then they and a, two two different skeletons. Um, they sent them to the state crime lab. They said well, they're definitely Native American bones. They're very old. One's a male. One's a female. That's all they knew about them. Um, so. I mean, I think that's where the kind of rumors that Chief Kewaskin was buried there, because there were burials there, um, but the park had been the the land around that that you know low area had been kind of flooded and, and reflooded, and there was a pig farm there at one point, and, and all these different things that that happened to the land itself. The dam broke and and you know, moved a lot of dirt around at one point, um, which is where they think these how they think these kind of came close enough to the surface for them to be found. Um, so again, the last report that we have of Chief Kewaskum in the historical record, um, he died in Mud, Mud Lake, and he was buried on this place called uh, Barber's Island, which um, locally was known as Indian Island because there were several burial grounds there. Um, that's the island there on the Google map. Um, 1878, we have this story. <laughs> this gentleman here from, um, from Hartford, and he tells the story of how he helped this doctor from Hartford open up the grave of Chief Kewaskum and take all the bones. Um, that was the thing, that was something that they did in those days for fun, I guess. Um, but also because, you know, doctors didn't have any other ways of, of getting skeletons to, to learn about. Um, so if they knew that there were graves there, that, you know, they assumed it probably, you know, been abandoned as far as they knew, um, they would just dig them up and, and pull them out. So, you know, the story here is, you know, he, he comes into the doctor's office later and he sees the, the skull on the bureau polished with brass springs on each side. The doctor says to, you know, pull down the chin, chin bone and draw it up and let it go and the teeth would crack up. And, and um, so he was told afterward that was 
must have been old Chief Kiwaskum who, you know, his, according to the local story, fell out of his canoe and drowned, and the body was in the ground for about 20 years. So that was, um, this is 1878, and again, the, the, from what we know, Chief Kiwaskum died in the late 1850s, so that would, that would all make sense. Um, so I, I did a lot of research on this Dr. Randall in Harvard, um, because I was trying to figure out if he, like, maybe he left the skull to his family, maybe it's somewhere around here in a historical collection somewhere. Oh, my eyes about fell out trying, you know, going through all the, the old Hartford newspapers on microfilm, and this Dr. Randall had a pretty, had a pretty horrible life. Um, he was, like, cursed, I think, um, because his, well, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> he, he ended up, he ended up out in Colorado where he got hit by a, a, a horse-drawn carriage and died. Anyway. Uh, pretty good teeth on the Yeah, yeah, I don't know where that, I don't know where that picture came from. Okay. Because the back of the dentist and he replaced it. Yeah, All right, so we're back to this picture. Um, so if, if all of that is true about Chief Kiwaskum in the historical record, um, where did, where did Father Mayer get this photo and... You know, how do we know that it's of Chief Kiwaskum? Uh, if it's, I mean, it's obviously posed, and it looks to me like it's in a in a, um, a photo studio. So logically, you know, Miller's studio was was the the probably preeminent photo studio in Kiwaskum for for decades, um, and that opened first in eight, the 1870s, late 1870s. So by that time, you know. The Chief Kiwaskum that we know from the historical record had been dead for at least you know 10, 15 years. Uh, so I don't know, you know, don't have any other explanation for this except that because Sean Tashner said that he recognized this hat, um, that that got me digging into a little bit of of his his family history. So as I was doing research on Chief Kiwaskum, I kept coming up with these names as Peter Kiwaskum and Mary Ann Kiwaskum. I kept coming up with these names uh, in various newspaper accounts, and I thought, well, you know, how could these people have the same name? These are these are Menominees, and they're they're from Menominee Reservation and from the Door County area. So I thought, well, how how do we can, how do we make that connection there? Um, so there's the Peter Kiwaskum. Uh, how could a full-blooded Menominee from Green Bay? Also be a Potawatomi chief from Dodge County? Well, obviously they couldn't be. There's two guys with the same name. Um, this is a really exciting thing. The, the Annals of the Association of American Geographers. Um, there is this really interesting boundary case between Michigan and Wisconsin. Took it all the way to the Supreme Court. They both really wanted um, Rock Island for some reason out uh, in the, on the corner uh, end of Door County. Um, and they, they couldn't figure out, like, where was the intended boundary um, in those islands out there. Uh, so they called to the stand um, <coughs> this full-blooded Menominee woman, Mary Ann Coda. Her father was Chief Kiwaskum, and his name is said to mean turning back in his tracks or his tracks are homeward. Um, so she goes on to tell the story of, of her father, Chief Kiwaskum, and how he was a riverboat pilot, and he, he had... You know all of the different um, ancient waterways memorized, and he he was the first one to help different settlers like go through, and and so it was kind of their way of trying to prove that these borders were already established. I'm not I'm not sure how the court case ended up. I'm pretty sure that Wisconsin got um, Door County, but I don't know for sure. Um, but the interesting thing was, so here's Mary Ann Coda. She shows up on on Sean Tashner's lineage chart. Um, and it says that her father was Chief Kiwaskum. Um, so as I was in communication with Sean, uh, he interviewed the oldest living person in his family, which is a woman named uh, Dorothy LePage. She's in her 80s. She's also in the lineage of Chief Kiwaskum, the Menominee chief. Um, so he called her and interviewed her, and he sent me a copy of the interview. Um, this is a picture. These are photos from... Um, from Dorothy LePage as her, her mother and her aunt. I just thought it was a nice picture. Um, so here's what, here's what their family story is. Uh, the name, the town of Kiwaskum, Wisconsin, is named after you know, her relative, this Peter Kiwaskum. And um, I mean, that's, that's a family story that they have passed down over generations. Um, 
So it turns out that he was not only was he a riverboat pilot, but he was also a, a mail carrier, evidently. And he would use the waterways of Wisconsin, including the Milwaukee River, to deliver mail. And he delivered mail as far south as Kewaskum. And so then, in honor of that, they named the village after him. That's, that's what their family story is, um, which is not at all what happened. Um, but they don't, you know. But they they didn't know because the, none none of them actually stayed in Wisconsin. They all kind of moved out all over. Um, but now we have this this kind of family history that places the Menominee, Kewaskum, in or near the village of Kewaskum at around the time that that photo was taken. Uh, so, who is who's the guy in the photo? Um, <laughs> That, that, that would explain the photo. Um, that would also explain a couple stories that um, Father Mayer reported in his history of the village. Um, so here's Holy Trinity Church. And one of the stories in his, in his history of the village is that uh, as people, they're building uh, Holy Trinity Church, um, is in, in 1905, uh, a telegram was sent. And there were two men working on the church, and they received the telegram, and it said, Chief Kewaskum has just died on the Menominee Indian Reservation. And they were either relatives or they knew him well, so they left immediately, and they went up to attend his funeral in 1905. Now, again, if this was our Chief Kewaskum, who seemed to be an old guy in the 1840s, 1850s, 1905, and he's another, he's going to be in his hundreds. So, it's, again... More proof that it's not, not the same guy that we're talking about here, but, it, but another connection with the village of Kewaskum. Uh, and then a second story comes from uh, Don Harbeck, who was the editor of the Kewaskum Statesman. Um, people, people have been really interested in finding about, out more about Chief Kewaskum for many years. And um, at some point uh, in the 1920s, Mr. Harbeck went up to the Menominee Reservation because he thought, you know, if, if he, he remembered that story... Uh, about the Holy Trinity Church, so he thought, well, if Chief Kewaskum died there, he wants to find out more information, he wants to know, you know, what, figure out what he can. Um, so he went up to the Menominee Reservation in the 1920s, um, he spoke to Chief Reginald Oshkosh, picture of him right here, um, he was the last of the hereditary Menominee chiefs. So, the, like, like uh, the other tribes that are still in Wisconsin, they, they are no longer, the chiefs are not hereditary, they have kind of councils that they elect now, you know, different people in the community that, that run the communities. Um, Chief Oshkosh uh, was at, he's college educated, but then he came back to the Menominee Reservation and he tried to kind of do his best to, to modernize it a little bit. Uh, but he, he was there at that time. He spoke to uh, Mr. Harbeck and he said, oh yeah, Chief Kewaskin was here. He died here. In fact, that's his great granddaughter right there. And supposedly then Don Harbeck met her, and he gave her some candy. I mean, it's kind of a weird story. Um, but the timing all works out, because at that time, uh, Sean Tashner's great-great-grandmother, uh, Isabel Coda, lived on the Menominee Indian, Indian Reservation. and she was, a, she was a child at that time. Um, so again, everything kind of makes sense, but, but it also doesn't make sense, because it's, we have these two different people... Um, but again, like like I said in the very beginning, uh, the name Kewaskum seemed to have been fairly common, at least in in the Algonquin languages. I mean, I don't know if it was like John or Jim, but but it, there were there were numerous people that had that name, or what what we would come to think of as that name. Um, so that's kind of uh, where my research led me. Um, so I had to tell Sean Tashner that. That uh, the chief Kewaskum that, that the village was founded at on is not the same person as his relative, but because of the information that I gave him about Mary Ann Coda and um, an obituary that I found from the Door County newspapers, they were able to prove that Peter Kewaskum's wife was 100% Menominee, which had all the percentages line up enough so that he, him, and his daughter were able to be enrolled in the Menominee tribe. Um, which is what they wanted. So it was, it was, it was a positive uh, reference interaction. Um, and so here's a picture of the last hereditary chief of the Potawatomi. Uh, he was alive from 1851 to 1831. Um, and according to him, uh, 
Chief Kewaskum's village was was a really important uh, village on Pike Lake, um, you know, all throughout the the 1800s. So um, from from everything that we know, I mean, we know that that this man was was the last of the Potawatomi chiefs in <clears throat> Wisconsin, um, but Chief Kewaskum was most likely uh, either the second, or I mean, he was probably one of the, one of the very the last handful of Potawatomi chiefs that was living, um, which again is another reason why, another you know, great reason to name the, the village and the township after him. So he was an important historical figure, even though we don't know much about him now, um, at the time for the, for the Potawatomi people, he was an important figure. So in 1913, the Potawatomi were finally um, allowed to legally stay in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the U.S. government finally gave them some of the money that they owed them from all the land that they sold them. Um, and so they don't live on a reservation. They actually took the money and they bought plots of land here in Forest County. So it's not a reservation. It's, it's land that they own. Um, and they don't have, uh, I mean, they, they do have a centralized tribal council and they have communities where they live, uh, Crandon and some other places like that. But um, but they don't have, it's not like the Menominee, which, you know, they've got the, the entire Menominee County is, is their land. Um, and then finally, here's the Forest County Tribal Council. Uh, I just took this off their website yesterday, so it's, it's very, uh, very up to date. Um, incidentally, this gentleman here is one of the last um, native speakers of the Potawatomi language, and he's been trying to um, uh, get it written down and get it recorded and, and teaching other tribal members in Kansas and Oklahoma how to speak their native language. Um, so again, kind of important stuff going on in Forest County. Uh, so it leaves us with um, some answers to some of these questions that we had about some things. But then it, it obviously it's not a real complete picture of Chief Kewaskin because I don't think, you know, with, with people who were here that long ago who, you know, his, his tribe, after he died, one of the stories is that his tribe um, ended up going to... Um, Horicon Lake, they call it, it was uh, Horicon Marsh, essentially, it was flooded and made into a giant lake. Um, they were they ended up there where the U.S. Army ro- rounded them up and had another round of, you know, shipping people off to Oklahoma. Um, so, it's, you know, we don't know if, if anyone in his direct lineage is, you know, either survived or, you know, would would have any anything to share with us from the Potawatomi Reservation in Forest County. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions about who Chief Kewaskin was. Um, but today, you know, the, the Forest County uh, Potawatomi are keeping their traditions alive. Um, they can't necessarily recover the stories of a lot of the clans, the individuals and the families from the 1800s. Um, only the names are left. And so the village of Kewaskum, um happens to carry one of those names. And there's a couple different meanings of Kewaskum. One is the way is crooked, and the more hopeful one is his tracks point to our home. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. You know, if you, uh, if you had the picture of Chief Kiwaska, and you said he had a, a, his grandson was in the service. Yeah. Civil War. Mm-hmm. And that picture was taken when? Uh, in the 1870s, from what we know. We don't know for sure, but it was oh, late, late 1870s. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It didn't put, so when did he die? Well, for, as far as we know, the Chief Kewaskum that the village is named after died in the 1850s. Um, my next question is, yes, sir. if you had that, that uniform on with a hat, mm-hmm. that was during the Civil War, right. so he would have had a, how would he have that picture, uh, that uniform? Well, because it, because it was a different person. It's not, it's my, not my, my, my research seems to show that that's not Chief Kewaskum that the village is named after. But a different person with the same name. With a different hat. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just got a couple of quick things. Uh, yeah. I see a lot of people from Kiosk come here. And do many of you know where the Wild Forty is? The road in Underland, that was the Wild Forty. Then two of you, you know all this. Well, that's uh, the West Pass of Milwaukee River goes through there. And there was an elevation uh, there's a higher bank, and that's what's called Indian Creek. Okay. And uh, near that land, there are burial grounds. Hmm. 
and I got the pipe here today that was given to my grandmother when she was 12 years old by the last living Indian in the water. Okay. Wow. Every, everyone else had left, but one stayed. And she got to know him, and he came for, you know, like they traded, and he came for food and, and stuff like that. But I have very little information on Chief Kiwaska. Yeah, yeah. But I do, do know where the last Native American lived. Okay. And um, where the burial grounds are. Okay. So uh, I guess anybody that's, this is actually in the town of Auburn. Okay. On a church. Finally, County comes pretty close to the US. Yep. 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 So I would pass this around, and if I may, uh, this is a little <laughs> branch, and it's put into this knot in the big branch, and it's held together with pine gum sap. Uh -huh. But this is the authentic, real type from the last living Indian in you know, uh, the Yeah. Wow. So awesome. I would pass this around, or if somebody would care to just come up and look at it. Yeah. Okay. And then I have some other. Uh, I don't know, anybody want to start? No. no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can I put it, yeah. open yeah. Them up, put them up on the table? Yeah. Or put it up on the table? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I've got some arrow points oh, yeah. that I purchased in Kiwaskum about three years ago. Uh, I'll put those up there too. Yeah. Anybody like to look at them? Yeah, anyone anyone who grew up in Kiwaskum knows that there are arrowheads all over the place in all the fields. Who's I think that uh, might be part of Amelie's. Oh, you know, yeah, you know, you knew Arnold Amelie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, then now his family Are we to meet with the idea land. that there were two and chief that would be was one of that. was Potawatomi and one was Menominee? You are to leave with that idea, okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she is. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you see, I mean, if you take Highway V, where, where the Menominee Reservation is now, their their people have been there forever. I mean, we don't know of a time when there weren't Menominee there. The, the Potawatomi came across from the New York area uh, in the 1700s, along with the Ottawa and the, and the Ojibwe, and they so they've been here for a long time. But, but the Menominee have been there forever. Yeah, so they they've definitely got a lot of information about, about their tribe. Yeah. That's a gap. This is okay. the tribes in Wisconsin in 1836. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's where they were. 1836. My, my oh, wow. Look at that. Sure. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this on the table there. Yeah. But I always thought that legendary hill was. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's just out of curiosity. That's on that. That's on that. That's on that. That's on that. I read um, a little yeah. bit about Chief Kiwaskum in that book. Then, <coughs> yeah, yeah. And there was like a part about how someone named Kiwaskum was hit by a train outside of Ridgefield. Right. And they weren't sure if it was him or if it was his son. Right. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, so. That that story is from one of the newspapers, and and there's no other information about that. Uh, but evidently, the Kiwaska, I mean, it was a last name that this family had in the Door County area um, up until a certain point. It's it's in if you look at the the census records, it's definitely there until um, I think it was Mar Marianne Coda is the last one, and then after that, it disappears. I mean, the family's still there. They changed their name. To something else, um, but yeah, I mean, it is certainly possible that that there was someone else with that name, uh, but not having to do with. And that that's one of the things that that when when Mark was doing his research, you know, he found these different stories that he just couldn't make sense of, you know, because they're all seem to be pointing to different people. <coughs> yeah, you know, people would write in logs and diaries, and, and uh, I'm sure there are diaries yeah. hidden in somebody's trunk. 
<laughs> I think about that all the time, too. Yeah, yeah too bad. You just can't go in all yeah. those. And, and then people move away, too. Right. Yeah, and there, there were, I, I was contacted a few years ago by a gentleman from Pine Lake who was doing um, research um, about the history of Pine Lake and the, the uh, new Uppsala community that was founded there by the Swedish people. Um, he had a story about his great-great-grandfather fishing with Chief Kiwaskam on Pine Lake. So, but he wasn't able to give me any more information. Yeah. It's just a question. I'm, when you said you're over by Pike Lake area, mm -hmm. yeah. where about was it again? Southwest? Uh, Southeast corner? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's pretty much exactly where the state park is right now, where the beach is. Mm -hmm. That's where at least this farm was, and then the the Chief Kiwaskin's village was in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and she gave she gave me a little more information too about about a, um, a flat white stone that had a map etched into it that was in the very southern end of her farm's property. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that was from you know the 1930s, I think. Um, so I don't know if it's still there or not, but yeah, I mean that whole the whole uh, east side of the lake there was was Chief Kiwaskam's tribal so, land. I'm from the Kiwaskam area. Mm -hmm. I'm still there. I grew up in Cedar Creek, just north of Oh, you did. <coughs> and my great great grandfather owned land on the southeast corner oh, of wow. Pike Lake. So oh, I guess we would follow Chief Kiwaskam. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. Probably. I know. Yeah, right. I mean, like, there's probably a lot of different people that may may have family stories or. You know, yeah. yeah, somewhere along there, and that—that's the next thing I want to do. I mean, all, almost all this research that I've done is has come from just web resources of various mm -hmm. kinds. Exactly. I think um, though, I'm not sure if they got a lot going on, but they had elections here for the boards, and I know there was a Sally S E L L E that is living in the Maxim home in Cedar Creek. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. I know the Maxim home. Okay. Ah. <laughs> all right. Yes, sir. I think that. With my grandmother, that happened about maybe 1870 or 1880. Okay. Somewhere I can't tell, you know. Yeah. No way of telling right. when exactly that happened, but it's right around it. So that would what you're sense. saying, that's all pretty close. Yeah, I mean, that, and that, that would make sense because there were so many Potawatomi. Um, in fact, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the days before um, the Potawatomi were given. Uh, we're, we're, before the Potawatomi bought their land in 1913, they were known as the, the, the strolling Potawatomi. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that phrase before, but it was because they moved from place to place all the time because they couldn't ever, they didn't have a place where they could stay legally. Um, until 1913, they were illegally in, you know, in the state of Wisconsin. So yeah, I mean, they, if anyone would have been around there, they would have been in the woods, you know, living very much like they did in the years. Yeah, there are, uh, in that land, there are five burial grounds. Hmm. That's always been kept private. Right, and it should it remain that should way. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So I'm probably one of the last. See, when I when I die, my name dies. Hmm. And uh, I'm probably one of the last people that know where no one's where they are. Hmm. So do you have a diary that we the rest of us can read later? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We need a map. We need a map. You better start writing down some of the information you need. Yeah, you can I, mark I it with arrow heads. You know? yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, it, was, it was nice yeah, to talk to you. I got one thing to share quick with. I didn't get anybody to look at those arrowheads. Not yet, because we're not But they are all fakes. Oh, oh nice. nice. <laughs> and I bought them to show people all good. They're probably five years old. <laughs> but how good a job people do in reproduction. Uh, so, uh, but they are all fixed. <laughs> <laughs>